Dr. Tom, welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to chat with you today. Oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. I really enjoyed your book, You Can Fix Your Brain. Love the positive spin on brain health. And I'm just curious, how did you start being fascinated with this topic? I've been on the teaching faculty of the Institute for Functional Medicine for almost 10 years now, I think. And uh, my area of expertise that I talk about is about the gut and specifically um, uh, intestinal permeability or the slang term is leaky gut. And so I teach physicians the science behind what happens. How does it happen? What are the triggers? And what we know, and this is a critical concept to understand for all of your listeners, one of my mentors and friends is Professor Alessio Fasano. Professor Fasano is, um, uh, he is the chair of pediatric gastroenterology at Harvard uh, Medical School. He is the director of the Celiac Center at Harvard. He's a professor of pediatric medicine at Harvard. He is the director of the Mucosal Immunology Center, meaning the lining of your gut and the lining of your lungs at Harvard. Any one of these statistics is a lifelong goal for someone and or these positions. And he's got many positions like that. He is the guy that identified the mechanism of what causes this thing called leaky gut back in 1997. And he and his team have been publishing on this literally hundreds of studies of what this leaky gut is thing is. Now they understand it to such a level. And this is, and I, get, I gave you his credentials so you understand this is not just some fly-by-night theory, but this is cutting edge from the top medical school in the country, arguably the top medical school in the country. There, we know that diseases are inflammatory diseases. Practically every disease is a disease of inflammation. At the cellular level, the cell is on fire. So it just depends. Is it a brain cell or a kidney cell? Is it gasoline or kerosene? But it's always a fire. So that's inflammation. So the goal is to live an anti-inflammatory life with all of what that means. And it takes a long time to really dial that down completely for an individual, but you just get started. Professor Fasano and his team published this year. He said, and this is the quote on the article, um, the, the title of the article. And these guys don't exaggerate, you know, because they're all, and people would love to take him down. And, and say, look what this guy's saying. But he's so careful in his language. The title of his article, All Disease Begins in the Parentheses Leaky Gut. All disease begins in the leaky gut. Well, what about Alzheimer's? All disease. What about rheumatoid arthritis? All disease. What MS? All psoriasis, eczema, migraines. All disease begins in the leaky gut. And this is what they're teaching our cutting edge physicians at the top medical school in the country right now, is that there are five pillars in the development of all chronic inflammatory diseases. And if your listeners understand that there are five pictures, that this is the big kahuna concept, if you understand this concept, then all of the information that you pick up in podcasts like yours or in books that you read like mine or in summits and things, you're able to compartmentalize that information into one of the five pillars so that you can hold it because there's so much information in our world today, we get overwhelmed really easily. So the five pillars. The first one is your genes, genetics. Nothing you can do about that, absolutely nothing. That's the deck of cards you were dealt in your life. But we now know that close to 80% of all diseases are not caused by your genes. They, you are, your genes, you pull at a chain, the chain breaks at the weakest link. It's at one end, the middle, the other end. It's your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys. The weak link is determined by your genetics. Okay, but stop pulling on the chain so hard and the link won't break. You carry the gene for Alzheimer's, that's not good, but if you do, you got the gene. Stop pulling on the chain so hard. Well, what does that mean? 
learn what causes inflammation in the brain that pulls on the chain, because that's the weak link that's going to break for you, likely to break. Just because you have the gene doesn't mean you're going to get the disease. It means that you're extremely vulnerable to disease. And the most current studies say that's true for about 80% of all diseases. Yes, you got the gene, but that doesn't mean you're getting the disease. It means you're vulnerable to the disease. So that's the first one of the five pillars. The second one is environmental triggers. What does that mean? Anything that comes into your body or is produced inside your body, like stress hormones, are environmental triggers. And the environment that they're talking about, Professor Fasano is talking about, is the environment around your genes. Because what happens in your genes, your genes don't have an on-off switch. They're all run on dimmer switches. So what you want to do is dim down the genes for inflammation and particular diseases, and you want to ramp up the genes for anti-inflammation. You know, for example, we've known for years, you eat one cup of blueberries a day, every day for three years, and at the end of three years, your cognitive skills are the same as what you had 13 years earlier because you're turning on the genes for anti-inflammation and increased hormones in your brain. It's called brain-derived neurotrophic factors. Sorry to geek out on you, but blueberries are really good for you, right? Because they dim down the genes of inflammation in your brain and they ramp up the genes for anti-inflammation. So that's what they mean by environmental triggers. The most common environmental triggers are what's on the end of your fork. That's the most common. Now, if you live in a house with mold, you, you got mold on your shower curtain, well, it's no big deal, it doesn't smell bad. No, man, you're sucking in those spores all day, every day, and they are pure gasoline on the fire. So whatever health condition you may be having a problem with, it could be that the mold spores that you're inhaling are ramping up the genes for the weak link in your chain, and here comes brain dysfunction or kidney dysfunction or liver dysfunction or vision dysfunction. Doesn't matter, just depends on where your genes are. But in this example, the spores from the mold may be ramping up that dimmer switch to express that gene. So the, the most common environmental triggers are what's on the end of your fork. That's why things like learning about gluten sensitivity can be really important for people or dairy sensitivity, or whatever the foods might be, can be the game changer in their health for them. Number three of the five- Dr. Tom, let me pause you before you get to number three here, because I think it's it's important we interject this story when we're talking about environmental. And this is something you shared in your book. When you were a kid, you grew up in Detroit, and that's where cars were being manufactured. And at that time, the regulations on air quality weren't necessarily that high. And I'll let you take it from there. And this, this led to you accumulating toxins as a kid and eventually a cataract. So talk about that story. And I think that's really applicable right here. That's a really good example. Yeah. Uh, uh, I grew up in Detroit and the first eight years of my life, we lived across the river and one block in from uh, Ford's Rouge River assembly line, the largest assembly line in the U.S. at the time. And there were no regulations on smokestacks in 1952 or 54 or 1960. There were no regulations that I know of. And so I'm riding my bike around as a kid. I'm sucking in all the fumes from the smokestacks unknowingly. And when I was 44, um, I used to do a lot of triathlons. And at that time, I was scoring in the top percent of the 30 to 35 year olds. So I was walking with pride. You know, I'm a Baywatch guy. You know, I'm scoring with the younger generation, top 10%. Good. I'm healthy. Well, no, I wasn't. I developed a cataract in one eye. And I spoke to a number of ophthalmologists, eye specialists, and said, Where does this come from? And they said, Well, it just happens. And I said, Well, no, it doesn't. There has to be a trigger. And so I started researching and I came across an article that said lead poisoning can cause that. And I thought, I don't have any lead. 
Well, maybe I'll check because I do a lot of heavy metal tests. And at that time, I'd probably done a few hundred heavy metal tests on patients, uh, maybe more than that, I don't know. Um, so I checked and I had the highest level of lead toxicity of anyone I'd ever tested, ever. And I thought, this is a mistake. Where, where could this come? Oh my God, really? Really? And for 40 years later, the lead that had been accumulating in my body caused the inflammation. And as I was aging, although I thought I was healthy, you know, tissues kind of slow down a little bit as you age. And so if something in the lens of my eye, maybe it's lymphatic drainage or something, allowed the lead to accumulate in the lens of my eye, here comes a cataract. And so I, of course, did all the detox to get the lead out and everything's fine. I've checked it three, four times since then, no more. But that really educated me that it may not be a current exposure, that we have things. I mean, if you had a thermometer break in your mouth as a kid or break in your hand or, you know, you're chewing on a thermometer or something, you got mercury toxicity. It can sit there for 30, 40 years. You never know that there's a problem until you cross a line of tolerance. Now, here comes the imbalance, wherever the weak link in the chain is. So apparently for me, in that example, the lens of my eye was a weak link and the lead accumulated there. So did you end up having surgery at all or did you totally, did. okay, no, you I had did. surgery I'm, as part of the treatment? Yeah, you bet. Uh, uh, that's the only surgery I've ever had, but my left eye, I've got a lens in there that, uh, so it puts me a little bit on the stage of a bionic man, I guess, you know, not much, but maybe a little bit. Uh, but it. Um, it really woke me up to the accumulative damage that um, occurs in our bodies. And that actually is a major, major topic that uh, we might get to here today. And it's in my book in great detail. All right, let's move into number three. Number three of the five. Number one is your genetics. Number two are the environmental triggers that activate your genes, either for inflammation or anti-inflammation. Which, by the way, that's why it's so important, every decision you make about what goes in your mouth, every decision, there's no slack time here. You know, if you've got a choice, I travel a lot, I lecture all over the world, and airports don't have, they're notorious for not having very good food. I mean, if you're into Cinnabons, you're in heaven, right? But aside from that, there usually isn't that much. And my weakness is potato chips. I like potato chips. So if my blood sugar is getting a little low, I want something to eat, but I don't want to eat the food in the restaurants and the airport. Maybe I'll grab a bag of chips. Or sometimes my mind says, why don't you grab a bag of nuts, maybe with a few raisins in it? And if I make the decision to go for the nuts, and I usually do, and I'll buy two or three bags and just keep them in my roller bag, but if I buy the nuts, that's a base hit going in the direction of turning on the genes for anti-inflammation compared to if I choose the potato chips, that's a swing and a miss. And that's strike one against you. You know, so every decision you make, every choice you make about what's on the end of your fork is going to have a positive or a negative effect on uh, which genes are expressing themselves more? Which dimmer switches are you ramping up? And there's the only neutral is healthy water. Everything else is going to ramp up inflammation or ramp up anti inflammation. And if you get that, it empowers you in those moments when you're having your potato chip or nut discussion, you know, or maybe it's Mountain Dew or. Uh, an orange juice discussion, whatever it should be. If you remember and think base hits win the ball game, every base hit heads me in the direction of where I want to go in my life. It might empower you to make the choice to ramp up the genes of anti-inflammation. So that's the goal. So number three is your microbiome. That is all of the um, uh, participants in what's in your gut. Mrs. Patient, 
your gut starts at your mouth and it goes to the other end. And in that tube, this one big long tube kind of winds around, you know, 20, 25 feet of this tube in there. The inside of that tube is where the bacteria live. And most of us have heard there's more bacterial cells in our body than human cells. And most of us have heard something about that. If not, let me just take a moment to say there's more cells of bacteria in your body than human cells. The ratio is 10 to 1. There's 10 times more bacteria in your gut than there are all of the human cells in your body, your bone, muscle, brain, skin, organs. Add them all up. There's 10 times more bacteria in your gut. Now, we know the genes control function, and I've already talked about you want to activate the genes of anti-inflammation, but here's a kicker for you. Those bacteria in your gut have 100 to 150 times more genes than the human genome. That we used to think when all the genes of the human genome were identified, and that was done around 2000, 2001, we thought we're going to cure all disease because we'll be able to identify the genes and then study and work to um, quiet them down. Turned out that's not the case. There's about 23, 24,000 human genes. Earthworms have more genes than humans. It's true, they do. So scientists have been saying, wait a minute. So it's not the genes necessarily that control whether we get health or disease or when we get disease. It's which genes get turned on and which genes get turned off. That's called the epigenetics, what's happening around the genes. So when you talk about environmental triggers, number two, we're talking about the environment around the genes, the epigenetics. And the more blueberries you eat, the more the environment around the genes encourages anti-inflammation, as an example. You know, and we talk about, it's not just blueberries, I'm using it as an example, but we talk about the rainbow diet. Eat the colors of the rainbow. The more colors you eat, the brighter the colors in general, as long as it's not food dye, you know, it's actually the colors of the fruits and vegetables, they turn on more genes of anti-inflammation than anything. And so the rainbow diet is a prescription for any health condition that people have. And you might want to do keto or paleo, or gluten-free, or dairy-free, or uh, um, specific carbohydrate diet. There are many diets out there, but you always want your selections to be based on rainbow colors. And that, no one argues with that. Every doctor understands that the polyphenols, sorry for the geek term, but the healthy nutrients that turn on your genes for anti-inflammation are in the colors of the rainbow. So the more colors you eat, the better. So number three is the microbiome. So that bacteria, 37%, over a third of all the molecules in your bloodstream, in healthy blood, 37% of those molecules are the exhaust of the bacteria in your gut. It's called the metabolites of the bacteria in your gut. 37% of everything in your bloodstream. Why? Why would the exhaust of the bacteria be in your bloodstream? Because we've known uh, Professor Michael Gerber uh, from Princeton in 1999 published the book called The Second Brain. And he said, you know what? For every one message from the brain going down to tell the gut what to do, there are nine messages from the gut going up telling the brain what to do, which brain hormones to make called neurotransmitters and how the brain functions. And so if you just Google depression and microbiome, here come the studies, anxiety and microbiome. Here come the studies, schizophrenia, bipolar, and microbiome. Here come the studies how the microbiome sends the messengers up to the brain to tell the brain what to do. So the microbiome is number three of the five pillars, critically important. And for every single patient that comes to us with a chronic condition that they're, they want to be seen for, we educate every single one of them. Mrs. Patient, in the big picture view, the one thing that you want to focus on for you and your family for the rest of your life is building a healthy, diverse, 
microbiome, meaning as many of the good guys of the different types of good guys as possible, because their exhaust creates the messages that tell your heart how fast to beat, to tell your brain how much serotonin to make, to tell your liver how much filtration we need, how much detoxing we have to do. The microbiome, the geek term is modulates. And what that means is has its hands on the steering wheel of how your body functions. The microbiome modulates human function. Now turn your steering wheel five degrees to the right. A hundred yards down, the, you're off the road, right? Have an altered microbiome. The term is called dysbiosis, meaning it's out of balance. You're off the road, you got depression if that's your genetic vulnerability. Or you've got joint pain and getting arthritis, if that's your genetic vulnerability. Or you've got kidney pain, if that's your genetic, it doesn't matter what the symptoms are. These are the five pillars in the development of all chronic inflammatory diseases. And when you're talking to somebody about the microbiome, are you having that assessed in a certain way, doing tests to see where that's at? And, and what do those look like? Well, most common test is a stool test, and there are many laboratories that offer stool tests. There are laboratories that are using the technology of the 1980s. Most hospitals are using that type of technology. There are uh, lab tests using the technology of the 1990s or the 2000. Some are using 2010. And then there are some that are using cutting edge tech. You know, I call this the 30-30. 30 years ago, it took a 30 by 30 room, floor to ceiling computers at Princeton to develop the computing power of this phone. And if I had tried to tell you 30 years ago, you know, I'm gonna hold this little thing in my hand. And uh, uh, when I hold this little thing in my hand, I can push a couple of buttons here and I can open what's called an app or an application and in five seconds, I can tell you that right now, the air particulate matter in Spiazzo, Italy is 82. That's a warning. The air particulate matter in Chicago is 43. That's very good, right? The air particulate matter in San Diego is 83. That's not good. You know, but in, any, in other words, I've got a walking encyclopedia in my hand for anything I wanna know in the world. And I can get that information in five to 10 seconds. If I had told you that 30 years ago, you would have said, yeah, right, right. What have you been drinking, right? That we wouldn't have understood that that was beyond fathoming that that was possible. That's the way it is with laboratory technology. That technology improves, improves, improves. And your doctors don't know when these laboratory tests that they have to offer to you um, were created. What level of technology are they in, in comparison to current cutting edge technology? So you can do a stool test that says you're perfectly fine, but you do a cutting edge stool test and you find all kinds of imbalances in your microbiome and too much of these bad guys and not enough of this family of good guys, or you've got the ratio that no matter what you eat, you're very vulnerable to turning on the genes for obesity because you've got a lot of the bacteria that hoards calories and stores calories. That's the bacteria of the Pima Indians. And the Pima Indians have this bacteria. You know, you compare Pima Indians that live in the Southwest US and their cousins that live across the border in Mexico. Same genealogy, same history, family history, but the ones in Mexico are eating a simple Mexican diet and you know, small villages that like their ancestors have been eating. The diabetes rate in the Mexican Pima Indians is 4% for type 2 diabetes. Then you compare them with their cousins in the southern part of Arizona or New Mexico who have the same genes, same genes, but they're eating McDonald's and fried chicken and pork rinds and potato chips and Coca-Cola and all of that. The diabetes rate in the American Pima Indians by the age of 35 is 50%. They've got the same genes, but the Pima Indian genes are based on their ancestors. How do you live in a desert? 
You can't grow broccoli in a desert. There's no water to grow lots of fruits and vegetables. So those people that survived in that harsh environment, their genes developed. The ones that didn't have good genes, they died. The ones that survived, they reproduced, and their children had more of those genes because the genes are passed on through the mother, generation to generation to generation. And so the ones that have a lot of the bacteria that hoard calories because there wasn't much food to eat. You never see an obese Indian, uh, Pima Indian in Mexico, right? That's living like their ancestors lived, or it's extremely rare because their genes for the bacteria that grow in their, that develop in their body hoard calories. So they get more bang for their buck out of every forkful of what they put in their mouth. But their cousins in the U.S., in the Southwest U.S., have the same genes hoarding calories, but they're eating Big Macs, right? And the, the, the nutrient-poor, calorie-rich foods of the standard American diet. And so 50% of them are obese by the age of 35. So that's the influence of the microbiome. Now, once again, the third of the five pillars. And the microbiome creates the metabolites, the exhaust, that is 37% of what's in your bloodstream. These are the messengers going everywhere in your body. So what kind of messages do you want going in your body to, uh, for, to activate the dimmer switches? Do you want the messages that say, calm down, anti-inflammatory, be relaxed, or you want the, the messages to say, fire, 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 store calories. I need more, more fat, more fat. Which ones do you want? Much of that is guided by the microbiome. Of course, your food selections are critically important in all of that. Of course they are. But why some people try to eat really well and they can't lose weight. It's their microbiome often that is a calorie hoarding, more bang for your buck kind of microbiome. So that's number three. I want to come back to the testing and the microbiome. And you talked about over the years how that's been changing so much. Where are we at today? If somebody wants to go and get a test done, who are you recommending? Oh, uh, Biome FX. Biome, B-I-O-M-E, F slash X is cutting edge. And they're identifying more of the type of bacteria. There are many good tests out there, but this is the one we're using. Now, we've been using it for about, um, about a year now, and it gives us more information and more interpretable information than any others that we've seen so far. So to get practical here too, say you do a test like that on somebody, you find out the microbiome is, is off and there's too much quote unquote bad bacteria. Where do you begin to you know, repopulate that with the good stuff? Is it through food? Is it through probiotics? Talk about where we're at these days, the cutting edge of, of fixing a microbiome. You bet. You bet. Um, there is a multi-phase approach to rebuilding a healthy microbiome. It's not a simple procedure, and, but I'm happy to go through it. But it'll take about 15 minutes to do it. And, but I'd like to get through the five pillars first, if I can, if you're okay with that. Sure. We'll come back to it. We'll put a bookmark there. Good, good, yeah, because it's it's critically important to know these uh, uh, things that you can do at home that make a world of difference for you and your children. Okay, so we'll go to number four. Number four of the five pillars is intestinal permeability or the leaky gut. Miss a patient, your digestive system is a tube, starts in the mouth, goes the other end, 20, 25 feet, winds around in the center there. The inside of the tube is lined with cheesecloth. Now, for those that don't know what cheesecloth is, you may remember watching your grandmother make gravy for Thanksgiving dinner. And after she makes the gravy, she pours it through this cloth. And so what drips out into the container is the nice liquid gravy, but the clumps of flour that she, you know, you put flour and you whisk it, the clumps stay on the other side. They're too big. They can't get through into the dispenser to pour gravy over your turkey and mashed potatoes and all that. The inside of your gut is lined with cheesecloth. Why? Because when we eat food, 
if you think of a donut, stretch a, one big, long donut out, a big, long donut, so it looks like a tube. That's your gut. When you look down the donut, it's one big, long tube. When you swallow food, it's not in your body yet. It's in the tube. And it's got to go through the walls of the tube into the bloodstream and to be the building blocks to build new bone cells and brain cells and muscle cells. Well, how does that happen? That's the process of digestion. So if you think of proteins like a pearl necklace, the acid in your stomach undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you have a string of pearls. Your digestive enzymes are scissors that cut that pearl necklace into two pieces and then four pieces and then eight and 16. Snip, 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 snip until you're down to each pearl of the pearl necklace. That's called an amino acid. And amino acids are the building blocks for new cells in your body. And amino acids go right through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. And then your bloodstream is just a highway, you know, it's just carrying traffic. And so it carries the, the two by fours, the bricks, the mortar, the nails, everything you need to make new cells. That's your amino acids, right? But to get through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream, it's got to be really small. You can't have a clump of protein to get through because your body can't use that, right? So that's why, it's also why your gut's 20, 25 feet long is because it takes a long time, much longer time to break down prime rib than it does a banana, right? So you absorb bananas really quickly. That's why if you have blood sugar problem, eat a banana and you feel better very quickly. But take a few bites of prime rib, it's not gonna make much difference for 20 minutes, 30 minutes or more, right? So you've got this cheesecloth, so that prime rib's gotta go further down the intestines, being snip, 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 until you snip off pieces small enough to go through the cheesecloth. Pillar number four of the five pillars is when you get tears in the cheesecloth. That's called leaky gut. And when you get tears in the cheesecloth, now bigger clumps of the pearl necklace, clumps of chicken or prime rib or whatever it should be, get through into the bloodstream. And your immune system says, whoa, what's this? This is not drywall or nails and uh, tool or supplies to make new bone cells and brain cells and muscle cells. I better fight this immune system, fight this thing. Now your immune system makes antibodies to fight this clump of chicken. Now you're allergic to chicken or to beets or to celery or to beef or to papaya. It doesn't matter what the food is. If a clump of food gets through tears in the cheesecloth, leaky gut, into your bloodstream, your immune system trying to protect you is going to attack this thing. That's what it's supposed to do. These are the people that do a 90 food blood test to see what they're sensitive to. And it comes back and they're sensitive to 25 different foods. And they say, oh my God, that's everything I eat. Well, of course it is. You got a leaky gut and your immune system's just trying to protect you. Don't worry about it. Let's just heal the gut, right? And then you go back and check in three to six months. Now you're sensitive to two foods, maybe three. And those are the ones you stay away from, right? So that's number four. Now, what happens here when these macromolecules, these big molecules get through into the bloodstream because of the leaky gut, your immune system makes the antibodies to fight that thing, whatever that food is. And the way those antibodies work, they're like special forces. They've got high powered rifles and they don't mess around. Now, there's no lanes of traffic in your bloodstream. Everything's going the same direction, but it's all bouncing around in there. So how is it that these antibodies can go after one specific thing in, in your bloodstream where everything's bouncing around? It's because they're special forces and they're trained to look for, I'll say an orange vest. And they, they're looking for orange vest. And the orange vest is the amino acid structure of that food molecule that they're looking for, right? So you got special forces going through the bloodstream looking for orange vests everywhere. They see orange, boom, they fire their bullet, they destroy it, boom, boom. The problem is the human tissue 
is made up of protein. So when the blood's going past the thyroid, for example, the surface of the thyroid facing the bloodstream is made up of proteins and fats. Well, the proteins are amino acids, hundreds of amino acids long, just like a pearl necklace. And some part of the amino acid structure of the thyroid looks the same as the amino acid structure of the chicken. And so special forces looking for orange vests say, oh, look over there, orange vests. And they fire their chemical bullet at the thyroid because it looks like orange vests to them. That's called molecular mimicry. That's a geek term. But when you understand these few basic concepts, you understand how foods contribute to the development of autoimmune diseases. And so you, when you have this leaky gut, the big molecules, the macromolecules that go through the tears in the cheesecloth set you up, and the leaky gut is called the gateway in the development of autoimmune diseases, whether it's psoriasis or rheumatoid or MS or Alzheimer's or cardiomyopathies. Um, it doesn't matter, or psoriasis, I said psoriasis, acne, it doesn't matter. The mechanism, all disease begins in the gut. That's what Tassano just published recently and because of these five factors. And pillar number five is the systemic inflammation going after the macromolecules, whatever they are, and then confusing them via molecular mimicry with your own human tissue. And then those antibodies attack your own human tissue and you develop lupus or you develop rheumatoid. Now there are many, many different triggers that can cause autoimmune diseases. This is not the only one, but every doctor who is trained in functional medicine or integrative medicine principles, who read these kinds of studies, every one of them knows with any autoimmune condition, you always also want to address the gut and the foods that people are choosing to eat as they may be fueling the fire more and more. All right, lots I want to get into here. That was that was a great overview. But let's let's come back to the leaky gut. So if somebody heals the leaky gut, are they always going to have the antibodies to whatever that food was that passed through? And no. if so, okay, I was going to say if so, won't that continue to attack the human tissue and make that mistake like you talked about? We could use the thyroid for example. So so you're saying when food's not passing through, we're not going to make the antibodies anymore, and then we're not going to be attacking our own tissue. If you read the science, and I've read a lot of this science answer, to try to answer that question, that the only, there is one food that once you make elevated antibodies to that food, it's for life. And that food is gluten, wheat. That when, when you get a vaccination, Let's say you're going to go to Africa. You need vaccinations months and months and months ahead of time for yellow fever and dengue fever and all these weird diseases that you might be exposed to. So what happens is they give you a vaccination and your immune system, your brain says, what is that? What the heck is that? Yo, immune system, make antibodies to fight that yellow fever thing. And you have a general that's assigned general yellow fever. General yellow fever builds an assembly line. The assembly line's job is to produce soldiers specifically trained to go after yellow fever. They're called antibodies. And it takes a few months to build that assembly line and get those antibodies up to speed. But eventually those antibodies kill off all of the yellow fever bug that you were injected with to stimulate that response. But now general yellow fever is vigilant the rest of his life. So when you go to Africa a few months later, you've already been inoculated against yellow fever. You're exposed to yellow fever, you'll never know because you don't get sick. Now, if you go back to Africa 15 years later, 20 years later, you just need a booster shot two weeks before you go that you don't have any antibodies to yellow fever for the last 15 years. There's no general yellow fever says, all right, there's no yellow fever here. Turn off the assembly line. 
you don't have any antibodies. But if you're going back to visit again, you, you get a booster shot two weeks before you go. And general yellow fever, oh, yellow fever's here. Let's turn the assembly line back on. He just has to flip the switch. He doesn't have to build the assembly line. That's why you just need a booster shot two weeks before you go instead of months before you go. The assembly line's already been built. General yellow fever, general dengue fever, general malaria, whatever the vaccination is, is called a memory B cell. The memory B cell's job for the rest of his life is specific to yellow fever, dengue fever, measles, whatever it should be. Memory B cell. The only food that I can find evidence of that you make memory B cells to is wheat. So you make a memory B cell to wheat, and how do you know if you made a memory B cell? If you have elevated antibodies, that means the assembly line got set up to fight wheat. And you've got, you've got a general wheat to fight to build the assembly line. So you, you go on a gluten-free diet, and your antibodies to wheat come down, and coincidentally, usually, the antibodies to your brain or to your thyroid or wherever it should be also start to come down. It's not co coincidence, it's therapy. Well, you get exposed to wheat, general wheat, the memory B cell is vigilant the rest of his life. And so he's just gonna flip the switch and the antibodies are back right away. Now I can't find any evidence of memory B cells against eggs or against soy or against dairy. I, I, I haven't been able to find it. But certainly with uh, gluten, there are a number of papers on that. So the answer to your question is, the only food that we know once you cross that line of tolerance and you're making antibodies and that it's permanent at this point is wheat. Interesting. So for a healthy gut, what are your thoughts on wheat causing a leaky gut? And then that would lead to creating the memory B cells. Like can anybody healthily consume wheat in your opinion? You have the exact same body as your ancestor thousands of years ago. The kidneys work exactly the same. The bladder works exactly, your joints work exactly the same. We use our brains more, so we've got food available all the time and we've got uh, uh, housing and safety, but the physical body works exactly the same. What did the immune system of our ancestors have to protect them from? This is a very big topic. Uh, to bring up, but I'm going to narrow it into your question. Our ancestors had to be protected from bugs, parasites, viruses, mold, fungus, and bacteria. That was it. There was no red dye number 42. There was no benzene. Every time you pump gas and you smell the gas, you're smelling benzene that's going right up through your nose to your brain throwing gasoline on the fire, killing brain cells while you're smelling the benzene. You're killing brain cells. Well, I feel fine. We'll put that on your tombstone in 10 or 20 years, that he felt fine when he smelled the gas, right? It doesn't matter how you feel. You're killing off brain cells, killing off brain cells, killing off brain cells. So when you pump gas, if you can smell the gas, you're standing downwind. Walk around the other side of the hose. Now you're standing upwind and you don't smell it. And, you know, we have to start thinking like that. But, it, but in any event, our ancestors didn't have benzene. They didn't have flame retardant chemicals outgassing out of your sheets and your blankets on your bed and on your pillow. And they outgas through dozens and dozens of washings. There's still trace amounts of chemicals. Well, there's no evidence that that amount of chemicals is harmful to humans. That's true. That's true. But this stuff is accumulative in the body over years, right? So our ancestors just had to be protected from bugs, parasites, viruses, mold, fungus, and bacteria. That was it. Your immune system is perfect to protect you from bugs, parasites, viruses, mold, fungus, and bacteria. Nothing else. And when you look at the response of the immune system against any insult coming in, it's always responding as if you're being exposed to a bug, parasite, virus, mold, fungus, or bacteria. Always, without exception, by definition. There's nothing else the immune system can do. So when our ancestors, their two top priorities of our ancestors was finding food. So they're foraging around looking for food. They find something, first 
they smell it, then they taste it. If it seemed okay, they eat it. But if there was bad bacteria in there that wasn't bad enough to taste or to smell, there wasn't enough of it, but if there's bad bacteria, it's supposed to be killed off by the acid in our stomach. That's why you got hydrochloric acid that's so potent and it'll eat through wood, but it can sit in your stomach all day if you have a healthy stomach uh, because it's there to kill anything that comes in with your food. That's a primary purpose of why we have such acidic acid in our stomach. But if anything got out of the stomach into the first part of the small intestine for our ancestors, there are sentries standing guard there. Now, the geek term for them is toll-like receptor 4. Toll-like receptor 4's job is to identify bugs. And if there's a bug coming in, it sends the immediate alarm message two places. The first one, create inflammation to kill the same. Technically, it's called NF-kappa B. It's the amplifier of all inflammation. The second message, open up leaky gut. Because when you open up leaky gut, water comes into the gut from the body to wash out whatever it is that you've been exposed to. It's a great defense mechanism we've got. So that's the job of toll-like receptor 4. There are nine toll-like receptors. Toll-like receptor 4's job is bugs. What Professor Fasano told us in this most recent, and he's been telling us this since I think 2006, but he referenced it again in this paper. The two most powerful triggers activating leaky gut is bad bacteria in your gut. It's called LPS, stands for lipopolysaccharides. Bad bacteria in your gut and gluten. And what happens when gluten comes out of the stomach into the first part of the small intestine the sentry standing guard misinterprets gluten as a potential harmful component of a microorganism. This happens in all humans who eat wheat. All humans. Dr. Maureen Leonard, very famous gastroenterologist, also at Harvard. She did a review. I think it was 64 studies. I'm not sure the number. I think it was 64 in 2017 on this topic. And the, the conclusion, gluten activates transient intestinal permeability, and this occurs in all humans who ingest wheat. That means you, whether you feel it or not, you get transient intestinal permeability every time you eat wheat, every time. Transient is the key word here. Transient means it doesn't last. This is patient, you have an entire new body every seven years. Every cell in your body regenerates except for your teeth, every other cell. The fastest cells are your gut, your, the GI tract. Every couple, three days, some studies say four days, you have a new lining to your gut. So you eat, you eat toast for breakfast, you tear the cheesecloth, it heals. You eat a sandwich for lunch, you tear the cheesecloth, it heals. You eat pasta for dinner, you tear the cheesecloth, it heals. Croutons on your salad, a cookie, tear the cheesecloth, it heals. Day after week, after month, after year, until one day, you develop what's called loss of oral tolerance. When you lose oral tolerance, and that comes about because gluten is also triggering more bad guys in the gut, number three, your microbiome, is triggering more bad guys in the gut, and when you get that dysbiosis, that abnormal microbiome, and now you have an inflammatory microbiome, at some point you cross the line, you don't heal anymore. Now you've got pathogenic leaky gut. Now you've got the gateway in the development of autoimmune diseases. But every human develops transient intestinal permeability when they ingest gluten. Just read the studies on this. And it's irrespective of how you feel when you eat it. So, Dr. Tom, before we move on from this, fascinating. I'm glad we got deep on that. Are we talking about all gluten or wheat? Because in your explanation there, you kind of went back and forth and you used wheat sometimes in gluten. At the end, you summarized with gluten, but we're talking about all gluten, right? 
really, really good question. And you, I see you've done your homework. It's wheat and all of the components of wheat. Gluten is not bad for you. Bad gluten is bad for you. There's gluten in rice. There's gluten in corn. It's not necessarily bad for you. It's the gluten that's in wheat, rye, and barley. That family of grains, that gluten is toxic to everyone. And, and so it's, no, it's not all gluten. And it really should, the, the accurate term is called a wheat-related disorder because it's not just the gluten in wheat. There are many different components of wheat that trigger an immune response, not just the gluten. Okay, important that we clarify that. And while we're well, talking- Can I say one more thing on that? That's why when you test, um, our rule is test, don't guess, test. The tests that your doctors are using, unfortunately, many of them are using tests from the 1990s. And when they say they're testing you for a wheat sensitivity, they're checking one gluten protein called alpha glidin. It's important to check, and about 50% of celiacs will have that one positive, but 50% don't. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We know celiac is a wheat problem, but how come it tests negative? Well, you know, that just happens. No, it doesn't just happen. You just haven't read the science. That there's over 62 different components of wheat that may trigger an immune response, not just gluten, not just the alpha glidin. So if your doctor is checking you for a wheat sensitivity, which is a really good thing to do, you have to be thorough. And the tests that are now the most comprehensive tests in the world, I lecture all over the world. Uh, this year, not so much. This year, it's all virtual. But um, in the last month, I've been in Rome, Lisbon, London, lecturing, all virtual now, but same thing. So I tell you, the best tests in the world are in the U.S., and it's called the Wheat Zoomer because you zoom in on the problem. And Mayo Clinic has written at least five papers, maybe more, talking about this is a new era in laboratory medicine. That's their language. And what they're talking about is that 30-30 concept. It's a new era. And it's 97 to 99% accurate every single time. And they're looking at 26 different components of wheat in the wheat zoomer. And you go to my website, thedr.com, thedoctor.com, just don't spell the word doctor out, thedr.com, and just look up the wheat zoomer, download the information, take it to your doctor and say, will you please do order this test for me? And if your doctor won't do it, for, uh, it's just because they don't know, because the science is rock solid on this from Mayo Clinic and Columbia and other places. If they won't do it, though, order it on my site. We'll, we'll give you the test so that you can find out for yourself. But I always prefer people go to their doctor so that the doctors can learn about this because they don't know. They just don't have time to be studying all this stuff. You talked about gluten in rice and corn, and it sounds like it's in a lot of other foods not commonly talked about. Talk more about that. And you said it's not harmful, so I'm curious how it's different. Well, it's not harmful unless you have a sensitivity to rice or unless you have a sensitivity to corn. And 50% of celiacs also have a sensitivity to corn. So you go gluten-free, but if you're still eating corn products, you still can make the antibodies to wheat, even though you're not eating any wheat, because your body is an inflammatory state. And it's called molecular mimicry. That's the geek term for it. But um, the proteins in different grains, we, we can be sensitive to any proteins. Any of us can. You know, some kids are sensitive to... Um, uh, peanuts, and that can be really, really dangerous, life-threatening anaphylaxis. So you don't want to take these sensitivities lightly. But most people never know they have a sensitivity because you don't feel when you have elevated antibodies to corn uh, or to wheat or to rice. And unfortunately, in our world today, the vast majority of rice is toxic with arsenic because they've been spraying the fields with insecticides and pesticides since the 1960s. So 50 years now, over 50 years, and many of these insecticides and pesticides have trace amounts of arsenic. Well, there's no evidence that that amount of arsenic is harmful to you. Yeah, no, there's maybe not, but this stuff accumulates. And when the rain comes, it washes down into the soil and it goes into the creeks, into the rivers, 
And then in the rice fields, they get the water from the rivers because rice grows in water, but the water is very high in arsenic. And the result is the rice has an affinity to pull the arsenic up into the plant itself. And so much of our rice is high in arsenic now. I mean, there's so much to learn about this stuff. It really is a good site for people to look at called the Environmental Working Group. These are people who, ewg.org. These are people who have been working for, I don't know, 30 years or more, uh, bringing information for free on what's the best sunscreen that's got the least amount of toxins? What about lipstick? What about the dirty dozen foods that I really should stay away from if I can't get organic? Strawberries were always, strawberries and apples were always at the top of that list because they're loaded with toxins, chemicals, uh, poisons. Uh, so EWG is a good place to start. But people need to realize it's a different world now. And we need to be patient with ourselves in learning this information. And see, the, the subtitle of my book, You Can Fix Your Brain, it was number one in seven categories on Amazon for brain and nervous system because it's really a good book. And it explains a lot of this stuff. But the subtitle of the book is just one hour a week to the best memory, productivity, and sleep you've ever had. And that's not meant as a cutesy subtitle. It's the only way to be successful in dealing with any health condition because when you start doing a deep dive, you get overwhelmed very quickly and you can throw the baby out with the bathwater and just feel immobilized. You don't know what to do. So you allocate one hour a week every week to learn something new. So you're going to come back to this podcast in a week or in a month. You're going to listen to it again and take a couple notes. That took you an hour and you're done for the week. Or in my book, you're going to go back to that page that talks about, you know, when you store food in plastic storage containers, put it in the refrigerator, the next day, the chicken has got phthalates in it, chemicals from the plastic. There's no evidence that the amount of phthalates in chicken stored in plastic containers overnight is toxic to humans. That's true. It's true. There's no evidence. But this, these phthalates accumulate in your body. They accumulate. And I want to come back to this in a minute. It's a really important concept. So you go back to my book and you look for the three URLs I give you for glass storage containers. And you go to mileskimble.com and Amazon and whatever the third one was. I don't remember. And you say, oh, those are, oh I, oh, I like those. I like those. And you order three round ones and two square ones and one for the pies. And you pay the credit card, hit send, and you're done. That took an hour. You're done for the week. But never again will you, will you poison your family with minute amounts of phthalates from storing leftover foods in plastic storage containers. For the rest of your life, that's done. And every week you take one hour to do something like that. And in six months, you really dialed this down. Your lifestyle has changed because you did it in a way that is just base hits, just base hits every day you know, or every week, just one base hit. And over time, it's accumulative that you're in the right direction. Now, I wanted to go back to the phthalates for a minute and show you what happens when these phthalates accumulate. 2014, a paper was published, 346 pregnant women in Chicago. They collected urine samples on 346 pregnant women, and they measured the amount of phthalates, chemicals used to mold plastic. The one that pe many people have heard about is called BPA, bisphenol A, in water bottles. And they measured just five phthalates of the hundreds that are out there. They measured five for these 300 plus women. And they took the results and they put them in fourths, the lowest fourth, the next one, the third, and the highest fourth. They followed the children, the offspring of those pregnancies for seven years. When the kids turned seven years old, they did Wexler IQ tests on them, the official IQ test. Now, there's not much in medicine that's all or every, but this was every, every child whose mother was in the highest quartile of phthalates in urine and pregnancy compared to the children whose mothers were in the lowest quartile, didn't matter their race, their age, uh, immigration status, didn't matter their um, uh, uh, net worth, um, none of that mattered. Every child 
in the highest quartile of phthalates, mom being in the highest quartile of phthalates, their IQ was seven points lower than these kids, seven points. Now that doesn't mean anything to anyone until you understand a one point difference in IQ is noticeable. A seven point difference is a difference between a child working really hard, getting straight A's, and a child working really hard, getting straight C's. This kid doesn't have a chance in hell of ever doing great in school. I'm sorry, but read the science. They don't have a chance because their brain never developed properly because mom was high in phthalates because mom had accumulated over 25, 30 years of life from all of the... When you learn that nail polish, the phthalates from nail polish are in your bloodstream in five minutes. Now, there's no evidence that the amount of phthalates that leach out of nail polish is toxic to humans. That's true. But this stuff accumulates and little girls start putting uh, nail polish on when they're five years old. And so they've got 20 digits, their fingers and their toes. They're putting a little bit of polish on multiple times a month, usually. And that stuff accumulates. So the women who had accumulated so many phthalates, not just from nail polish, but from all of our exposures, and in the course of their 25 or 30 years, now in their first pregnancy, you know, they're ho hopefully a healthy pregnancy and a healthy delivery, but that baby's brain never developed to its potential. That's the impact. That's the accumulative impact of lo losing threshold when you cross tolerance levels. That's what's happening to all of us now. Really important information there. But what I want to talk about is the person listening to this and they say, oh, no, I've been, you know, I've been storing my chicken in plastic for 20 years and I've been using nail polish and and maybe I'm, I'm going to get pregnant in a year. And that's part of my life plan to start a family. Again, you can fix your brain, the title of your book positive spin. Let's put a positive spin on this and talk about what somebody would do in that case when they realize, you know, I'm probably toxic right now, or even if they've had kids and they just want to live a longer, healthier life. What do they do to start to clear all this junk out of their body? You have to get educated. There's no way around. There's no magic pill. There's lots of people saying, take my detox program and you're going to be fine. Nonsense. Show me the studies where they're fine. You, of course, want to do detox programs, but what we all need is a detox lifestyle, minimizing the amount of exposures. We get glass storage containers, get organic nail polish, take your coffee, your stainless steel mug into the coffee shop and say, fill it up, please, as opposed to getting the paper cup with the plastic lid on it and the steam from the coffee condenses on the other side of the lid, drips back down into the coffee full of bisphenol A and you put the coffee cup up to your lips, the hot liquid hits the underside of the lid, tapers down into the opening, you're drinking your coffee or tea full of bisphenol A. That you have to get, it's the only way. You have to get, you have to do the deep dive at one hour a week. It's gonna take you a year, six months to a year to really get a big picture of how to change the direction of your health. Plus, you work with a functional medicine practitioner, an integrative medicine practitioner who understands these principles and has an answer for you that makes sense to you when you ask the question, how do I get the toxins out of my body that have accumulated over the last 25 years? And if they say, well, we've got a program and it'll be done in two months, you know that you're in the wrong place. Get out of there. You know that uh, it may help. It certainly can help but it's a change in lifestyle. You can't keep living the lifestyle that's caused the problem and expect a different result. That's the definition of crazy. Doing the same thing, expecting a different result. We have to understand that all of the gobbledygook we've been taught that everything is safe. In the 1950s, if you go back and you look in the microfilm, of the, the editorials in the major city newspapers and the stories on atomic radiation, they all say, oh, those, those atomic blasts in Nevada with the big mushroom clouds, it's safe, it's not toxic to humans, don't worry, it's safe. In the 1960s, they started telling us that cigarette smoking was safe. In the 1970s, hydrogenated fats were safe. In the 1980s, high-power tension wires are safe. In the 1990s, 
cell phone radiation is safe. You know, industry always puts a spin on something so that the media, the mass population accepts it and then it's so convenient and we, we like what we've got. You know, we like the convenience of our lives and we go along with it. And the result is we're going down as a species. We're going down. When you read the National Academy of Science, our best scientists in the country saying that we have 54 growing cycles left on the planet. 54. You say, what? Well, and then what? Then there's no more food because we're killing the soil. We're turning the soil into dirt. And you can't grow anything in dirt. You can only grow in, but we're killing the soil. But then you learn that regenerative agriculture, you know, you're going to spend an hour a week, you'll listen to, you'll Google, or maybe you've had an expert on, on regenerative agriculture, and you learn, oh, well, I want to support the farmers that are doing regenerative agriculture. That's something that I can do. If I live in a city, I can support those farmers and buy their produce and their stuff and, and those ranchers buy their meats. And, and you start learning the little things that you can do that we could turn this around quickly. I think, I think it was like within 15 to 18 years, we can completely turn around the direction of climate change just by dealing with regenerative agriculture. And the science is all done on this but it's not profitable to anybody. And the companies that make billions on this are, are gonna keep the emergency break on so it doesn't happen. Well, we'll target to do this in 30 years. No, no, you won't. I mean, we need this now, right? So it's the education. That's the most important thing that we can start with. You know, I don't have all the answers, but I do know the primary thing that we need to do is to accept I need to get educated on this. I'm going to spend one hour a week so I'm not overwhelmed and I'm depressed and, and say, God, there's nothing I can do. You, of course, there's plenty we can do. But if you take it in bite-sized pieces and get educated on this, you're going to raise healthy children. You're going to be young and vibrant of spirit in your 70s and 80s and into your 90s. You're not going to have the degenerative diseases. You're much less likely to. But we have to reverse the direction we're going. And in my book, You Can Fix Your Brain, I use that system of the body. I could have written the book, You Can Fix Your Heart. You can fix your gallbladder. You can fix your joints because the concept is the same. It just depends on where the weak link in the chain is as to where it's going to manifest. Because and Fasano put it so well when he said there's five pillars to all inflammatory diseases five pillars deal with this and you arrest the development of autoimmune diseases. And so, well, it sounds so simple, but it's not, you know, number one, the genes, you can't do anything about that. Let, let that go. Number two, environmental triggers. You can do everything about that, but it's going to take time. When you learn that indoor air pollution is worse than outdoor air pollution in most cities, you what? And when you learn that you should only run your dishwasher at night when everybody's asleep, so there's no one in the kitchen because the dishwashing soaps you're using are extremely toxic chemicals. They get boiled almost to boiling and the steam they produce because those dishwashers are watertight, but they're not airtight. And the gases are leaking out into the kitchen and into the other rooms. Get out of there. You know, so go, go to bed, close the doors, go to bed. And you learn all these little things, turn off the wireless at night. You don't need wireless when you're sleeping, right? So that you're not getting bombarded by... You have to learn all these little things you do at one hour a week, every week. The result is in six months or a year, you got this. You got this. And I know every interviewer, I wish I had the answer for what can we do now? What, what, what can we take that'll fix this? You're not going to fix it until you get educated that the moment we have a boulder going downhill really quick. It's our brain function. It's going downhill really quick. And how do you stop a boulder that's going downhill? You can't. You can't. You try and get away, you get run over, right? The only thing you can do is pour dirt down here, build a mound so that you flatten out and it's not downhill anymore. So then that boulder starts to flatten out and then you can add more dirt to go uphill 
and then you can stop the direction and reverse the direction you're going in. There's no program that's going to do that. There's no pill that's going to do that. Education is the only thing that will do that. It's a paradigm shift for people. I totally agree with you on that, Dr. Tom. But the thing is, there is so much education out there and so much media. Where is somebody going to get their biggest bang for their buck digging into the education? Okay, well, that's, that's, that's what I'm curious. Where we, other than your books, say somebody has your books, well, where else do they go? Because again, in the 21st century, there are so many things, YouTube videos, podcasts, documentaries. We can get just as overwhelmed with the education piece as well. You bet. So, you so bet. where does somebody start? How do they narrow that down and know where they're going to get their most value? Well, that's a really good. I understand what you're saying. And um, in reading the books, they're structured in such, such a way. There's some like 32 tips in You Can Fix Your Brain. So I think it's 32. But, you know, it's, it's one week I'll do this. One week I'll do that. One week I'll do this. And you pick the ones that are most relevant for you. Uh, but you accept the concept of one hour a week. That's the first thing. And for you, maybe it's one hour every three days, you know, whatever it should be for an individual. But the message is be kind to yourself. Understand that you have to have patience with this process. And when you learn about plastic leaching into food and leaching into beverages, you're done with cups from a coffee shop. You know, that, and I tell people, you get four stainless steel coffee mugs, four, and you keep them in a bag in the back seat of the car. Uh, why in a bag? So they don't roll around and clank into each other. You know, uh, once you've done this often enough, you get the little tidbit, little pearls. And when you go to the coffee shop on your way to work in the morning, you just take your stainless steel container and say, fill it up, please. And then you take it, you're drinking it. You know, at night when you come home, you put it in the kitchen sink and you've got more in the car. You know, next day you do the same thing. And when you've got three or four of them there, now you'll wash them and you put them in a bag by the door. So next time you go to the car, you just grab the bag and you take them with you, right? And so you learn all those little things so you're minimizing your exposures. You get an air filtration system that really works well. Um, the one on our website that we recommend you is called the Air Doctor. Uh, uh, it's ranked number one of the top 10 air filtration systems. Just Google Air Doctor, you'll see it there. Uh, uh, you, you get water filtration systems. You get, you, you learn that you have to clean your shower heads. When you learn that shower heads accumulate bacteria, and then you learn how do you clean a shower head and that you should really clean it at least every six months. If you live in warm climates like Southern US or Hawaii or the Caribbean, you have to clean them every three months and you learn how to clean them. Uh, because what happens when you take a shower, you turn the shower off, the water has come up the pipe and it's just inside the shower head, but you've turned it off. So it's not going to uh, continue coming out. There's bacteria in that water, hopefully not much. They used enough chlorine to kill most of it, but that bacteria can start to colonize, reproduce, and it produces a polymer is called a biofilm, like a plastic that protects it. And you get this plastic coated colonies of bacteria. And it's not the good bacteria that uh, is beneficial for us. And the result is eventually you get in the shower, you turn the shower on, you get blasted with millions of Klebsiella pneumonia bacteria, the number one bacteria that causes pneumonia. It's the number one infection in hospitals that people get is Klebsiella pneumonia, or you get Pseudomonas or other bacteria that's been growing in the shower head. Just Google shower heads and bacteria, and you read the studies, you go, oh my God, really? So all you have to do is learn to, and you just take a wrench, un take the shower head off, and you soak it in vinegar, at least 8% vinegar. You can't use the the diluted stuff that you buy in the supermarket. You have to go on Amazon and buy vinegar. It's really cheap. You buy a gallon of it, it'll last you for a year, cost you like 30 bucks. And every few months you clean your shower head, especially if anyone in the family has any lung, head, neck related problems like 
asthma or bronchitis or ear infections or eye infections or sinus infections, you learn that, wow, this is real. I had no idea that this was happening. You read these studies and it drops your jaw. Uh, one group, one study, they compared Colorado shower heads with Hawaii shower heads. And they all were full of biofilm and pathogenic bacteria. And they replaced them with new ones. Within three months, the Hawaii ones were all contaminated again, but it took almost a year for the Colorado ones to get contaminated. So the warmer climates, the bacteria grows more quickly. So in the warmer climates, you have to clean your shower heads every three months or so. And it's really simple, just soak them in this vinegar, and they're, they're good to go. You know, you, you get rid of the biofilm and you flush out the bacteria that was accumulating up there. But you have to learn all these little pearls. There's no simple way. And many of those pearls to begin with, you'll learn in my books. But there are other doctors who are talking about the little pearls also. Just be cautious. Fasano talks about environmental triggers, microbiome intestinal permeability, gateway in the development of chronic diseases. He's not talking about a detox program. He's not talking about a particular vitamin C that's better than any other. Ours is the best of all vitamin C. You know, none of that. Of course, detox programs are important, and we counsel our patients on detox programs as a component of everything they're doing. You've got to get the crud out of your body that's been accumulating in there. But the big picture is the five pillars. And as you put a little bit of attention on each of the pillars, over time, you find you get younger and stronger and healthier. And people start saying to you, you look great. What happened to you? That happens more and more often. So one thing I want to clarify, you've been talking throughout the whole conversation about the five pillars by Fasano. I think early on in the conversation, you said that all five pillars lead to leaky gut, and leaky gut is at the source of all chronic conditions. I just want to make sure I have that correct. Is that what you said? Uh, no. Uh, no, it's not that all five pillars lead to leaky gut. Leaky gut is the fourth pillar. I realized that. That's why I was confused. I thought it was somehow tied in as well. Okay. Right. But um, you don't get chronic inflammatory diseases unless the macromolecules go through a leaky gut into the bloodstream and your immune system trying to protect you fights those macromolecules. So leaky gut is an essential component in the development of systemic inflammatory diseases. But if you have a healthy microbiome, not an inflammatory microbiome, you don't get leaky gut. So that's why gluten activates uh, it, transient intestinal permeability in everyone. It's transient. You heal from it. Don't worry about it. But when you cross that line of tolerance, which occurs at two years old, 22 years old, 92 years old, somewhere it's going to happen. Now you go from transient leaky gut, number four, into pathological leaky gut. Now you go to number five and systemic inflammatory diseases. So the microbiome is the key. That's really the key. You want to identify leaky gut and take some nutrients and things to help heal that leaky gut quicker. And we can talk about that if you like. But it's the microbiome. Of, of course, the first thing is your selection of environmental triggers that you're putting in your body. That's the first thing. And then how it affects the microbiome is the second thing that sets the stage for the leaky gut. Dr. Tom, I want to come back to something we opened up earlier and didn't end up coming back to, and that's number three, the microbiome. And we talked about before the different ways of testing and how that technology has gotten better over the years, but we wanted to get into what it would be like for somebody if they found out they had dysbiosis and, and a disrupted microbiome, what would that look like to help rebuild that? Yeah, well, the first thing is stop throwing gasoline on the fire. That's the most critical component. Stop throwing gasoline on the fire. And well, what does that mean? It means you have to find out what foods you're sensitive to that may be fueling this uh, uh, dysbiosis you have, like gluten or dairy or corn or soy or eggs or whatever it should be. And there's a 
wheat zoomer, a dairy zoomer, a corn zoomer, a, a soy zoomer, a lectin zoomer. There's all these tests that have that cutting edge technology now. So you get comprehensive answers to identify that. Once you are um, clear that you're on the path of identifying and eliminating the gasoline on the fire, that's the first step. That's why so many people get better to a degree just by going gluten free because they stop throwing gasoline on the fire. Uh, but they often don't heal completely because you have to deal with the microbiome also. But when you want to address the microbiome directly, there's a number of steps. The first step, feed the good guys in your gut. How do you do that? Those are called prebiotics. Prebiotics are foods that feed the good bacteria in your gut. Mrs. Patient, when you go shopping, to buy vegetables, always buy organic. There's many reasons why it's so important, but buy organic if you can. But buy a couple of every root vegetable in the store. Get rutabagas and turnips and parsnips and radishes and carrots and sweet potatoes. Not many white potatoes because they affect your blood sugar a lot, but every root vegetable in the store. And every day you have at least one root vegetable. Well, I don't know what to do with a turnip. Well, neither do I. But what I do is I just dice up a turnip. I slice an onion, peel some garlic, put a little coconut oil in a pan, saute it all up together until it's soft, put a little peanut sauce or red Thai chili sauce, whatever you want on it, and I eat it. Well, what do you do for a rutabaga? I dice it up, slice an onion, peel some garlic, put a little coconut oil in the pan, in the pan, saute it all until it's soft, put a little sauce on it, and I eat it. You don't have to be Julia Child here. You just got to get it down, right? And, and then you'll Google recipes for, you know, and everybody's gone to a restaurant, a fancy restaurant where they shave radishes and they put them on the salad raw. And you have these really thin little bites of radish. Oh, that's pretty good. Whereas if you take a bite of a radish, it's pretty potent, right? But you can shave a little radish and put it on there. The idea here is to have one root vegetable every day. Then, Mrs. Patient, go to that great library in the sky, Google, and type in list of prebiotic foods. Print it out, put it on your refrigerator, and you're going to learn that an onion is a prebiotic, a garlic, garlic's prebiotic, a banana is a prebiotic. That you don't need a lot of weird foods like chicory, which is great, but most people don't know what chicory is. And have two from the list and one root vegetable every day. Every day, without exception. One root vegetable and alternate the root vegetables and two from the list of prebiotics every day. Why? Why do you alternate and don't just eat carrots? because every root vegetable feeds different families of good bacteria in your gut. And the critical thing you want is the diversity of a healthy microbiome, meaning all of the good guys in abundance. So you wanna feed all the good guys, radishes, turnips, parsnips, rutabaga, Jerusalem artichoke, carrots, sweet potatoes. Every day you have one. Next, Mrs. Patient, Get five different types of fermented vegetables. Get sauerkraut, kimchi, fermented beets, curry flavored, whatever you want. And every day you have a tablespoon of fermented vegetables. You can have more if you want, but every day you have at least a tablespoon. And why? Because when you ferment vegetables, and every vegetable is different, you produce different families of the good bacteria. So by alternating the fermented vegetables you're eating, you're inoculating yourself with lots of the good, friendly bacteria. The science says when you do this, you increase the amount of good bacteria in your diet by 10,000 fold. Not two times, not double, not triple, 10,000 times more. Just by having a little bit every day. Next. When patients are acute, we give them supplements of prebiotics and probiotics for a couple of months. Mrs. Patient, I don't want you to take this forever, but I do want you to take it for a couple of months. Uh, now, my wife and I take them, we just put them in our smoothie 
the prebiotics in our smoothie, and I do it long term, but I'm not asking you to do that just for a couple of months so you can jumpstart while you're changing your lifestyle and eating these foods that will feed good bacteria. You're giving concentrated prebiotics and probiotics right now. Next, there is an enzyme in your gut that arguably is the most important enzyme with the greatest effect on the health of your gut. It's called intestinal alkaline phosphatase, IAP. IAP lowers the amount of bad guys in your gut, raises the environment of good guys in your gut, helps them bind onto the walls of your intestines and encourages them to colonize, grabs the toxic stuff called LPS that Pisano says was one of the two triggers along with gluten as the most powerful causes of permeability, reduces LPS from getting in by 73% and lowers cholesterol, lowers triglycerides, stabilizes blood sugar. Many different studies on the benefits of IAP. The pectin from apples increases IAP. This is why an apple a day keeps the doctor away. So Mrs. Patient, when you go shopping for your fruits and vegetables, always buy organic, get about 10, 15 apples, and important they're organic if they're available because apples are always on the dirty dozen list of environmental working group as most toxic if they're not organic. But wash them, don't peel them, dice them up, get rid of the seeds, dice them up, put them in a pot, so if the apples are about this high in the pot, add water about one third the height of the apples. Throw a little cinnamon in there, maybe a few raisins. If your kids like sweet, they like raisins. Turn it on high, just let it boil for a good 10 minutes, 12 minutes maybe. Look in the pot. When you see a shine on the skin of the apples, you've released the pectin from the meat and from the underside of the skin. It's the pectin's been released. So now when you eat the applesauce, it's readily available to produce IAP in the small intestine. So after you've cooked it for 10, 12 minutes, there's a shine on the skin of the apples. When it cools off, my wife puts it in a blender, blends it up so it's really smooth like applesauce. And you have a tablespoon, couple tablespoons a day. Well, can I have more? Of course you can have more but at least a tablespoon or two a day. And in the long term, your homemade app, only homemade, the store-bought stuff doesn't work. Your homemade applesauce is gonna help create the positive environment in your gut to create a more powerful, healthy microbiome. Next, this is patient. There are many, many products out there that really have been shown to help with creating a healthier gut. And lots of good science behind glutamine, vitamin D, fish oils, lots of good, good products out there like that. Lots of good science, don't argue with that at all. They're all one note players, you know. Vitamin D turns on genes to heal the gut that glutamine does not. Fish oils turn on genes to heal the gut that vitamin D does not. So. It's called a pleiotropic approach. We give patients a pack called GS support packs. GS stands for gluten sensitive. GS support packs, there's 22 nutrients, but it's one pack of six pills. Mrs. Patient, can you take one pack a day? Because nobody's gonna open up 22 bottles a day, but they'll take one pack. Can you take one pack a day? Yeah, I can. But they're, all of these different nutrients are one note players. There's only one substance that plays the entire symphony, and that's colostrum. Colostrum is nature's way of healing a leaky gut and supporting a diverse, healthy microbiome. The first three to five days of mother's milk is not milk, it's colostrum. Because colostrum goes down there and it turns the genes on that says, okay, let's close those tight junctions of the leaky gut, because every baby in utero has a severe leaky gut. It's normal when they're inside mom because everything's swimming around in there. You know, there's not as many boundaries. But colostrum says, time to close those tight junctions now. 
All right, let's get the good guys. Good guys, I want you to dock over here. You lay your foundation over here. And that's what colostrum is doing. So we give our patients colostrum for a couple of months uh, when we're first starting out, <coughs> excuse me, to jumpstart the system. And there are many good colostrums out there. The one we use, we really like because it's the only one that I know of uh, that comes from grass-fed cows. They're not organic, but they're grass-fed cows, no antibiotics for 30 days before calving. So there's no residue and no growth hormone in them at all. No heavy metals, no toxic chemicals. Every batch is checked for 43 different nutrients. And this colostrum is licensed by three different countries in Africa as the treatment of choice that the government pays for when someone's diagnosed with HIV because it really works to help support the gut. So it's called GS Immuno Restore. It's on our website, but any colostrum is going to be helpful. So to review, root vegetables, download the list of prebiotics, have one root vegetable, two from the list every day, take a prebiotic supplement for two months, fermented vegetables, a tablespoon a day, have a variety in your refrigerator, take a probiotic for a couple of months, make your own applesauce and colostrum. And if you do have leaky gut, if that's confirmed, we also give them the GS support packs for a few months. That is the protocol that we find has helped so many thousands of people. I mean, it works and it works really well. Really comprehensive. Thank you for sharing that. And LPS has come up a couple times, and I want to get in and explain what that is. And you mentioned it's a culprit for causing leaky gut. So first explain where it comes from, what it does, and how do we avoid having that issue? Well, LPS, 1.7 million people a year in the U.S. get sepsis. Sepsis is the number one cause of death in hospitals in the U.S., and over 250,000 people a year die from sepsis in the hospital. Sepsis is the accumulation of LPS over decades that we house this toxic exhaust from bad bacteria. And the studies show it accumulates in your lymph nodes in, in under your arm and in your inguinal area. It accumulates in your spleen, in your liver. It's in your brain. When they do autopsy on people who died of Alzheimer's and they look at the plaque in the brain, it's loaded with antibodies to LPS. So LPS got into the brain. And it's a very toxic inflammatory compound. If you wanna think about LPS, how potent is it? When you start a charcoal fire, some people will squirt charcoal lighter fluid um, on the coals. They light a match and they throw it on there. Sometimes the match doesn't catch. And you have to light another match and lay it gently down on the coals, angling so the fire stays, you know, the flame keeps going. And you squirt the charcoal lighter fluid on the coals next to the lit match. If you squirt the charcoal lighter fluid on the on the flame, it douses the flame and puts it out. Right? Have, have you ever had that experience yourself? Yeah, for sure. It's a pretty common thing. What would happen if you had squirted gasoline on those coals and threw a match on there? Boom. Whoosh. Baboom. LPS is gasoline in your body. Highly inflammatory high immune response to this toxic crud that, that accumulates in a dysbiotic gut. So the more out of balance your gut is, where there's not enough of the good, see the good bacteria, just by numbers in your gut, suppress the bad guys. The competition for food, the good bacteria wins every time, unless you've wiped out or reduced the good bacteria. And that happens when you take antibiotics and things like that. And then the bad bacteria can rear their ugly head. They produce LPS, which is one of the two most powerful triggers in creating intestinal permeability. And that stuff gets through the leaky gut into the bloodstream, and it sets up shop wherever, it, you know, the blood's a highway. So wherever the LPS pulls over, if it pulls over in your spleen, 
you accumulate there, then you get antibodies attacking the LPS in your spleen. You get inflammation in your spleen or you get inflammation in your brain. Those are people in their 30s and 40s who say, you know what? I'm getting old. I don't remember the way I used to. Well, how old are you? Well, I'm 36. Well, that's not supposed to happen. There's something going on there. There's inflammation going on, right? So LPS is a real nasty. And the cool thing, a really cool thing, is in the wheat zoomer, that blood test I talked about that is so great, and it's even now a finger prick test. You don't even have to go to the doctor to get the blood draw. You just get a finger prick, and it's same accuracy. That the wheat zoomer is also contains the most comprehensive test for intestinal permeability, and they check for LPS. So you can get all that done in one blood test. So that's it's very cool. Very cool. And you share in your book, Dr. Tom, I know this is really personal, but your mother actually passed from LPS. So you have a really personal connection to this. And and I'm so sorry to hear that oh, about your you. mom, but thank you, so much. you you do have a real connection to this topic. Yeah, you bet. You bet. And uh, I just watched her go and nothing, nothing I could do at the time. Absolutely nothing. And, uh, uh, but it's, that's why I dialed this down. I mean, I really understand this one. When I do a presentation to docs on LPS, they sit there and their jaws drop. They've just never seen these studies before. They don't have time to go looking around for all these studies like I did out of necessity. And then, you know, I do an LPS presentation and they're all convinced afterwards, I need to check this. I need to check this for me and my family and I need to be aware of this for our patients. Very common feedback that we get. And that's where the Zoomer test comes in. That's exactly right. Got it. And Dr. Tom, I know we're pushing time here, but one final thing I think we have to get into to full circle this conversation on on the brain, and that is the blood-brain barrier. We've talked about leaky gut, but something similar can happen in the brain. So I think we need to get into that and talk about what's causing that and is there a relationship between that and, and leaky gut? You bet. Um, the markers of a leaky gut, the uh, technical names are zonulin, actin, myosin. They are the same markers that make up the boundary of the blood-brain barrier. So the boundary of the tube of your intestines is made, uh, made up of zonulin, actin, myosin, other components. But when you're testing for leaky gut, you're looking for antibodies to zonulin, actin, myosin. When you have elevated antibodies to zonulin, actin, myosin, the antibodies are in your bloodstream. They're going everywhere. You know, you did a blood draw. They're in your blood. And when they go everywhere, they're attacking zonulin, actin, myosin, wherever they find it in the blood. So when the blood goes past the brain, if you have elevated antibodies to zonulin, actin, myosin, they're attacking the blood-brain barrier. So if you, have, if you are positive for intestinal permeability, the leaky gut, you likely are positive for leaky brain. I call it, it's called a breach of the blood brain barrier. That's a technical term for it, a breach. So I call it B4, capital B number four. You got B4. Well, what do I do? The same thing you do for the leaky gut. It's exactly the same protocol. You got to reduce the antibodies. How do you do that? By your environmental triggers, that created the abnormal microbiome that calms down the inflammation that stops the intestinal permeability. So these molecules get into the bloodstream and then they travel everywhere and they attack wherever they see their target. It's the same treatment protocol as a component of treating a brain. Just go on Google and type in depression and inflammation and you will see so many studies or anxiety and inflammation, or schizophrenia and inflammation. You will see so many studies that when you reduce inflammation in the body, you reduce depression, you reduce anxiety, you reverse schizophrenia when you put them on a gluten-free diet. Not every time, but often enough that there are many papers on this. So when you understand that these boundaries, see, Professor Fasano is the director of mucosal immunology. The mucosa is the lining, the lining of your gut, the lining of your brain, the lining of your lungs. That's why they've dialed this down, is because they've done 
20 plus years of research at Harvard on this. And this is cutting edge stuff. You know, um, I, I start many of my talks for doctors with the slides from the British Medical Journal that say the average, not the exception, but the average is 17 years from when translational research is first published before the doctor down the street is using this information in his practice. 17 years. And when you read Fasano's work, you see that he's been talking about this. Well, I think when he first talked about the pillars, uh, he started with three pillars uh, in 2004, 2005, and then there was the fourth pillar and then the fifth pillar. So it's going to be a decade before most doctors are familiar with these concepts because they don't have time to read all this research that's coming out. But this just makes sense. You know, when you read it, it just makes sense. Stop throwing gasoline on the fire. Well, what does that mean? You have to find out what's causing inflammation in your body. What are the environmental triggers causing the inflammation? Love it. And I feel like we've come full circle now and I can finally let you go. Dr. Tom, other than heading over to your website, I'm going to link up your social media, your website in the show notes. How can people connect with you after the show? Oh, thank you. Thank you. My team put something together. Um, uh, and I'm going to look right now to see what it is. I'm, um, I, I, I never know, you know, what they, because I do a lot of these interviews. Um, hang on a minute here. It's, uh, okay, here it is. Um, the gift is, um, you can fix your brain a sneak peek. I did 87 videos on what it takes to fix your brain. 87. And that's our brain masterclass. And we're giving you the uh, uh, sneak peek. This I think it's four or five of the videos. So you, you can just look at this thing. So, well, I didn't know that. And I'm not sure which ones. It might be the shower head in more detail or whatever it is. But relevant topics that people can implement right now. And if you go to the dr.com forward slash free my brain, forward slash free my brain, and you can download those videos and watch them and hopefully you'll implement those, put them into action. They say, well, this makes sense. I think I'm gonna get this guy's book. Or I did the audio for the book. You know, uh, my first book, I did not do the audio, and uh, but the second book I did. and. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, literally, because eight hours a day for four days, every word, every sentence, you have to stay conscious. You can't be thinking about what's for dinner when you're being recorded, right? Uh, but it came out really well. And I knew I nailed it. I knew I nailed it when the recording technician in the studio behind all of the gadgets that this was a 40 something guy that had. Uh, uh, tattoos down his arms, onto his hand and his fingers, tattoos coming up his neck to the bottom of his chin. You know, one of those kinds of guys. And uh, uh, at the end, I look up when I finish, and he's got tears running down his cheeks. You know, this kind of tough guy. And I was, oh, yes, got it, got it. So I knew that the impact was there, and he shared with me afterwards, his son's been sick for quite a while. And this just makes perfect sense. And no doctor's been able to figure out what to do. This just makes perfect sense of why this kid's brain is not working very well. And he was so grateful. And he started crying with me a little bit. And uh, so it's also an audio. You know, you're welcome to the audio. It's on Amazon or somewhere. I don't know. You'll find it. You, you can fix your brain. Perfect. Dr. Tom, you gave a lot on this interview. Really enjoyed chatting with you. I'm going to link everything up in the show notes, and hopefully we can do this again sometime. Look forward to that. Thank you so much. Thank you.